Greetings to all. We would like to thank you for joining us for the 26th edition of the annual investment meeting webinar series. My name is Karen Pizan, Investor Relations for AIM, and I'll be your MC for today. The annual investment meeting is the largest investment platform in the world. An initiative of the UAE Ministry of Economy, AIM has been promoting a healthier global economy by linking investment opportunities to fast-growing economies under six key pillars, foreign direct investment, foreign portfolio investment, small and medium enterprise, startup and future cities, with a special event, One Belt, One Road. We would like to thank our multilateral partner, Islamic Corporation, for the development of the private sector for sponsoring today's webinar. Just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. If you experience any issues with your audio or video during the webinar, just refresh your browser and that should take care of everything. We would suggest using Chrome, Firefox, Safari, Microsoft Edge, or Opera. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the question tab in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. If you like a specific question, vote for it under the questions tab so we can address it to all our speakers. During the webinar, we'll be running live polls located beside the question tab. The request, we are also re requesting you to participate by casting your votes. So the topic for today's webinar is urban mobility. It's a road to recovery. This session will discuss the impact of COVID-19 on automotive and public transportation workforce, production and services, measures taken by the transportation sector to combat the pandemic and increase the safety measures, rebooting and implementing micro-mobility in the cities, what is the future looking like, and the opportunities that can be taken by the transportation sector. I would like to introduce the session chair for today's webinar, Mr. Sarwan Singh, managing partner of Middle East, Africa, and South Asia at Frost and Sullivan. Mr. Sarwant brings with him over two decades of experience in strategic consulting and advisory for Fortune 1000 companies, public sectors, enterprises, and multilateral organizations in the mobility and advanced technology sectors. He is Middle East, Africa, and South Asia region leader and a global practice leader of the automotive and transportation and aerospace and defense team. He is also the leader and founder of a think tank group within the organization that works on future megatrends. He will be joined by a panel of experts. And so, Mr. Sarwant, may I request you to please join me on stage. And the floor is yours to introduce the panelists. Thank you, Karen. Thank you very much. A very good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you, depending on which part of the world you are in. I'm based here in Dubai, and it's absolutely amazing, sunny, and hot out here. Um, in today's discussion, I've got a very strong group of panelists. Um, in, in cricket, we say you need a strong batting order and an opening order, and I definitely have here today. We've got a good mix of entrepreneurs and what I call on, uh, entrepreneurs and intrapreneurs. So intrapreneurs are people who, like entrepreneur, entrepreneurs, actually build a business within an existing organization, and that's exactly what we have. So let me introduce my panelists. Um, first, uh, we have Fatih. Fatih, if you don't mind just raising your hand. Fatih is president of DHL, the Global Auto and Mobility Sector. Um, I normally say that you know before uh, before you leave this world, you need to do three things in life. One is write a book, uh, have a child, and have grow a tree. And uh, I think Fatih has done better than that. He's not written one book, but he's written two books. And Fatih, I look forward to discussing those books um, uh, that you have written on time management and cross culture management. Uh, Fatih will talk a little bit about freight mobility and also his experiences within the auto sector and the impact COVID is having on it. We also have on the on the on the on the panel today Dheeraj. Dheeraj is literally a rocket scientist. Uh, I kid you not. He has worked for NASA. He's a computer scientist, and he has himself built some very incredible things. Apart from building hardware, he's also now building platforms, and he is building an amazing startup on um, on micro mobility. And we'll hear a lot about it a little later on. 
The other one, again, an amazing entrepreneur is Wilhelm, Wilhelm Hedberg from eCar. He is the CEO and founder of this company. Uh, amazing journey, which started with a small concept. He's made it realize it. It's very much operational here in, in UAE. He's expanding it to Saudi Arabia and other parts of the world. So a big warm welcome to all the panelists here today. Thank you very much for joining us today. Okay, before we start, let's have a quick poll question. Um, so if you don't mind um, going on to the poll questions, we'd like you to, to uh, ask, agree with a few statements just so we can understand how COVID <laughs> is impacting your mobility experience. So if you can go to the, um, to the polling site and just answer to those polling questions. So the first question we have here is, do you agree with this statement, yes or no? Uh, I have decreased the use of public transport and taxis and traveling more by private transport. Or oh, right, driving less mileage in my private transport than I used to before. Or the third one is maybe I'm considering buying a new or a used personal vehicle. So we are getting a response here. Um, and the response seems to be a bit like I'm driving less mileage in my private transport. I've decreased use of public transport. And interestingly, um, people are also considering buying a new or used vehicle. So please keep voting. But let me ask the panelists, what do they think about this response? So let's start, um, if you don't mind, uh, with you, Dheeraj. Yeah. Yes, yeah, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Great. So yeah, I mean, I think. Uh, the response what we are getting on this poll is, is is what was anticipated. It is exactly what we are also facing. And I personally, I face that. And one of the reasons for that is, very interestingly, the the COVID has impacted us, making us more uh, you know more efficient in terms of the resources, right? Um, so we are not the of course the you know the lockdown and the restrictions which uh, the government has uh, imposed. So we are traveling less mileages, working from home, uh, which is great. And uh, you know, and and using public transport, uh, everybody is worried about. I think that's the trend we are seeing. Uh, you know, uh, everybody is concerned about the you know the sanitization, the hygiene, and all that in the public transport. So that's that's happening in that space, and that is actually creating a different, uh, totally different, you know, the phenomena. What we call it. Um, which is, you know, getting more on the personalized, uh, customized, uh, so that people can take control of their own safety and you know, uh, the, the hygiene part of it. I think that's that's what it is, uh, Stalin. Yeah. Willem, what are you seeing, especially in terms of um, your personal business? Are you seeing an impact of COVID? Sure, and, and thanks again for having me on. Um, yeah, of course, uh, during the 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 worst part of COVID, let's call it sort of the initiation of COVID in the UAE, which was more or less the second week of March, um, there was complete shutdown. There's kind of a, now it's become kind of an iconic photo of Sheikh Zayed Road at nighttime, and it's just completely empty. Um, and it's just amazing to think that, that you know, the ability of, of the government to, to step up like this and have everyone sort of stay at home, uh, not go outside in order to contain this kind of virus was a was a pretty uh, amazing accomplishment in and of itself. So, yeah, on the on the on the short run, of course, there's been a tremendous amount of impact that happened with the, the lockdowns. As those lockdowns started to the, sort of started to be released, you can see reporting that's coming now from, for example, the Apple Mobility Report, which I urge everyone who's listening to to Google search. It's a really cool uh, function. You can type up any city in the world, uh, more or less, and it'll give you the amount of, of mobility shift from baseline. So actually you can see now in the UAE, the amount of cars that are being driven, as of the last data I saw a few days ago, we're only about 18% below baseline. Um, in Riyadh, however, um, they are back to driving the same amount as they were in uh, January and February. So it's as though COVID has now come full circle and now it's back to no impact. Whether or not there's gonna be another uh, lockdown, another wave that will come through, that's another question altogether. But we are seeing the trending now, it's coming slowly and surely back to back to baseline. 
Thank you, thank you. And Fatih, um, let's ask a little bit, what is, has been the impact to freight? I mean, one thing we did see during COVID is the e-commerce deliveries going up. What is your viewpoint on the impact uh, of COVID to the freight mobility industry? Yeah, there was um, definitely a big uh, impact. So uh, if you take um, air freight, uh, more than 50% of the belly capacity of the passenger aircrafts uh, was lost. So, of course, it was important to compensate a little bit, you know, with charters, you know, all kinds of uh, private freighters in order to compensate for that. With ocean freight also, that de the capacity is decreased by more than 25 to 30 percent. So that was um, driving to a lot of bottlenecks uh, and, and productivity uh, issues. So uh, the concept of just in time uh, became like an illusion for uh, some time. However, uh, during all this period, the logistics industry was uh, operating full speed. And you can see that also from uh, the quarterly results of uh, several companies uh, there, because there was an incredible rise of e-commerce. So um, uh, and just to give you an idea, normally the proportion of B2B is uh, less than 50% for our express division and and uh, and then it then it was climbing to more than 70% of course you had less b2b but you had an incredible increase of uh, uh, business to consumer activity so uh, there was definitely a big impact but it was uh, i would say a shift in activities uh, productivity due to distancing measures uh, challenges related to capacities uh, on the other hand, a lot of creativity and a lot of, uh, and, and the, I have to say that the logistics business kept, you know, moving and it's still moving uh, full speed, you know, during all this period. Yeah. And to be honest, big thanks for that. I could still get my mangoes and my grocery delivered on time, which was absolutely essential. And I think we all showed that keeping those trucks and that freight moving meant we, you know, we didn't have to you know queue up in front of the shopping markets to 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 boost our our toilet roll um uh, stocks for example so now thanks for that let's do another quick poll um let's try and understand what has been the impact of covid on personal mobility um so if we can if you can all go back to the poll and so the question i has I have for you is what has been the impact of covid on your personal mobility and please choose any two from the options we have i'm traveling less mileage I'm afraid to use public transport. I'm opting for more e-commerce and ordering deliveries, and there's no change in my personal mobility habits. So Fatih, correctly, this, this definitely looks like one good for your business. Uh, people seem to be opting for more e-commerce and ordering deliveries. Uh, and it does seem like um, many everybody more or less agrees that there has been a change in their personal mobility usage. So let's keep seeing the votes coming up. But maybe, Fatih, if I can ask you another question. What has been the impact on last mile logistics of COVID? So I have to say that uh, short term, I mean, uh, there was not really uh, you know, an, an incredible impact of the last mile logistics because you know all was put in place in order to address that trend that we have now for five years. Uh, so it, the only thing is that, you know, uh, delivery sometimes lasted a little bit longer, which can be sometimes a challenge if you have temperature control deliveries or, or, or things like that. Um, however, uh, you know, something that, you know, is changing is that, you know, uh, several logistics companies have um, sustainability targets, sustainable mobility targets. So, for example, for us, you know, we aim to zero emissions by 2050. So that means that, you know, electrification is important. It's not just by compensating uh, carbon emissions that you will do that. You need really to have a lot of activities in your supply chain. So we are increasing the usage of um, uh, electric uh, vans uh, in, our, in our supply chain. At one point in time, we even uh, created ourselves in partnership with the university an electric van because we did not find any uh, OEM that met you know our requirements especially that you know you need the right economy now we don't need to do that anymore but we 
that that's something that we will see on the on the increase definitely plus some of the uh, last mile measures like you know uh, urban uh, warehouses that are at the outskirts of the cities and all kind of uh, activities so because when you look at last mile uh, you have sustainability elements that are very important you have also economic elements so you need to uh, massify some of uh, uh, these uh, shipments and that's also uh, important and, and you you have also uh, some uh, service elements that you need to integrate so some of the habits of the customers may need to change where they may not get you know their packages all the time at home but they may go to you know, some uh, delivery centers or some other areas and for the last mile we even look into some AGVs and, uh, and, and different ways uh, related also to micro mobility uh, in order to make sure that we have fluid movements uh, in the cities. Yeah, excellent. I think great to hear that e-commerce also means electrification of the power train. Um, yeah. Maybe a question for you, Wilhelm, related to this. I'm afraid to use public transport. Have you seen a shift in people using new mobility modes like car sharing? Yeah, so again, there's a lot of data out there in the world on this. The, the, the front runner in the data on post-COVID is China. So what we're looking at is mobility reports that are coming out from China and seeing how are the Chinese who are first out of the, the tunnel um, reacting to a post-COVID world. And, and what we're seeing is there's a, there is some significant sectors that are taking some big hits and there's some sectors who are taking some, some additional uh, benefits from this. So as far as public transport is concerned, that is the largest hit of, of, of all of the mobility modes. Um, people are not feeling very comfortable to take buses and trams and, and metros and things like this at this point. Um, but furthermore, they're also, there's limiting amount of seats, right? They have to block seats between people so they're, they're not carrying as many passengers as they were before as well. So now you have a, a mass influx of people that are looking for alternative modes of transportation and you know there are there are options out there you can do ride hailing or taking a taxi where you can have a driver who in theory could be uh, a covid carrier right so it's somebody who's been coughed on all day by by passengers i'm not saying that that, that that's the case i i'm saying that that's what people are understanding in the market could be a risk associated with taking uh, on such a, a form of mobility so what, what has uh, decreased as well then is ride hailing so ride hailing has seen a decrease as well in, in China. What has seen an uptick has been car rental and, and mobility services like car sharing, whereby you're in your own private enclosed sterilized environment and also scooters. I've, we've, they've seen an uptick in scooter use as well post COVID. And, and the largest increase has been bicycles. Bicycles are doing super well right now. People just want to ride a bike around. So it's, it's really quite interesting to see um, whether or not also this is going to stick uh, or if this is just a trend and a fad that will happen until a vaccine or or if it's going to stay. But um, yeah, definitively, there's been certain markets like the large scale public transport who have taken a very significant hit now post COVID. Thank you, Wilhelm. So let's go to Dheeraj. Dheeraj, it was very interesting um, to hear from uh, from uh, from, uh, for example, from the Prime Minister in the UK for funds talking about bringing micro mobility on the roads. So, has that been a has that been a blessing in disguise for for your business? So, so let me tell you. I mean, uh, I've been very deeply involved uh, in the UK as well. I mean, I've done some work for uh, for the strategy for the Crossrail projects and in, uh, in London quite a lot. Very interesting, uh, the two cities in the world, the New York and the London, they were the totally against this micro mobility. They were the first one because the, the confusion was that they thought that this micro mobility or e scooters are supposed to coexist with the, the existing transport modes. They didn't understand that they, they should not coexist on the same roads because these are not worthy of running on the, the roads where your cars and you know the motorbikes and the, the trucks are running. And COVID has really taught them and given them the insight. I mean, I've been, uh, you know, doing a lot of uh, uh, the canvassing and, and talking to them and convincing them in, in, in New York City and even in the London that look, this is this is something which is very very interesting, very useful. And this is something which will help, you know, uh, improve your mobility in, in your city. 
So clearly now the COVID has clearly given them some insights and it's open. This definitely helps us. It helps because we also have an intent to go uh, and, and operate in those cities, but as well as giving the confidence uh, to as a benchmark to the to the, the to the MENA region cities where they see that now London is opening. So everybody's concerned for the safety, right? Safety is one of the major concerns for the micro mobility. People say small vehicles, you know, no small wheels, and these vehicles are very unsafe. Well, what is not unsafe? If you take a car, a car runs at 120, 140 kilometers an hour. These scooters run at 15 kilometers an hour, right? Yeah. Which is that puts, even a person, human can uh, jog or a little bit brisk walk can be, you know, 10 kilometers an hour, 10 to 12 kilometers an hour. So definitely it is, it is, it is, it is helping us. Uh, but during the COVID, just, just to add to a quick point that during the COVID, Period. We saw a very interesting, very interesting, very interesting things. Well, first thing is uh, Dubai police and Dubai municipality. They asked us these scooters to do their patrolling, to to go around in the narrow areas in the in the nights and easily move around, leave the thing, the scooters anywhere they like to leave, and we could able to do this uh, community service to them. The other thing which is very important happened, and, and I would say that with the Fatih's uh, point, there was a surge. So initially when we launched, this was totally targeted towards B2C. And during the COVID, it actually we new business model, which is B2B emerged. And one of them is the, the deliveries. One of them is the deliveries. That, so it's a last mile delivery. Some of the restaurants and some of the supermarkets, they prefer those. Because it's, it's very quick. They don't, need, they don't need a big parking space. You can leave it outside the door of any building and then you go and do it. Other than that, there were so we also ran a poll during the you know during the, the COVID to our 40,000 you know active customers and we got a fantastic response. 20% responded. And out of those 20%, the 80% said they would like to have a long term rental of these scooters. So the new business model because they wanted to have something which is their personalized which they can keep and sanitize, keep hygiene level too, so that they can run, not to use uh, you know, the public transport as much. And those business models really, really created a new you know, a new market for us. Makes but sense unfortunately, we, yeah, unfortunately, we couldn't run it because some of it is running, but not much because of the overall lockdown. So there's an increase in demand for micro -mobile. Yeah, I'm sure that lockdown will ease and we'll be seeing your scooters on the road. I can't wait to get on one of them. My son absolutely loves them. Uh, and absolutely. I get, yeah. So moving on, let's have another quick poll. Uh, let's try and understand what makes people comfortable using new mobility solutions like car sharing uh, and others. Um, and especially, let's try and understand what is the impact of COVID. Um, so you have the question here. Uh, uh, if you don't mind just going and voting again, what would make you more comfortable using new shared mobility solutions like car sharing? taxis and e-scooters again please click any two of them ah a pretty decisive vote here uh, looks like well while the team is voting Wilhelm, let me ask you a question mm -hmm. and i've heard this one which is based on this poll here uh, people say they get put off by car sharing if they have to walk more than five minutes would you agree with that yeah there's studies on it too so effectively if if you have a vehicle that's further than 500 meter walking radius of where you are, it's a very low likelihood that you're gonna book that vehicle. 500 is sort of the threshold. Within 200 meters, you're twice as likely to book a car than it would be the, the car that would be 500 meters away. Now, those are European standards, and ultimately it's gonna be a, a tremendous amount worse here in the, uh, in the UAE, uh, because uh, it gets much hotter. So um, location, distance to where users are is, is everything. But luckily, we're pulling a tremendous amount of data these days from where apps are being opened to categorize hotspots so we can allocate vehicles properly. And, and in so much, eCar is actually the world's highest utilized uh, car share service, which is uh, eCar Dubai. Yeah, and I heard it's almost seven hours to eight hours a day, which is- that, that, was in, that was in our peak time, yeah, before COVID. It's down a little bit, but we're, we're you know, obviously we're picking up. Yeah, that's good. And I know the uh, utilization of those cars defines profitability, so that's good for you. And yeah. Dheeraj, what would you say uh, to pick up yeah. a micromobility solution? How far do I need to walk? Yeah, so you literally want that with, I mean, you just come out and you want you want to locate near you. Just 
coming out of your doors, right? And then this is something very interesting we have, we have seen. Uh, so we found that, uh, I would say that, uh, that we are very proud that in Abu Dhabi, we were able to take 35, at least 35 cars off the street. There are 35 users, which we found through our data. So this is all about the running that, so this is a digital solution. That means your decisions have to be based on your data analytics. So we found some people who are using early in the morning to go to the work and coming back from, from work to home. So we, we found that they are looking for, if you think of it, they have to be where they come out of their building or their house, they want to see their scooters around. And we made use of data and made sure that our regular users, the scooters are available. And it was a total uptake. And it was a constantly, you could say every working day, they're using in the morning and to end the evening while coming back home. And we, kept, we started reporting to the Department of Transport as well, which was audited by them as well. It's a 35 cars off the street in three months. Wow. We, it's a remarkable achievement. Very nice. Very nice. Excellent. Cool. Well, let's go into another poll question. Keep the audience engaged. Um, so if you can push another question, uh, we'd like to ask you, which shared mobility modes do you think are most attractive in the region? And in particular, we are interested in your views on some of the uh, more modern or new mobility solutions like car sharing, carpooling. So if you don't mind picking up, which shared mobility modes do you think are most attractive in the region? Uh, okay, I think more people are voting. If you can go to the poll uh, poll feature on your uh, screen and poll. So we're seeing an interesting voting pattern here. Um, so mm -hmm. looks like Dheeraj, you are definitely winning over car sharing, but just about. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like the people in the region definitely want to see more e-scooters. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, interestingly, metro and buses. Now, who would have thought in Dubai? Now, Dubai is interesting. You know, it it came from a background where it was a very car based uh, city, but now it's more balanced. It's called multi modes, and also, as we know, it has one of the highest mileage driven um, in terms of ride hailing. Um, also, interesting to see car sharing is picking up here. Um, anybody from the panel? Any views on this polling results? Well, I can forget about the e-scooters. E-scooters are fun. So that it's, it's a very interesting thing, the way that people uh, look at the e-scooters. E-scooters have some sort of a fun element to it, while you know the distance is covering from three to five miles. And the, about the five miles is majority, if you think of it, is a very high percentage of distances covered by people is the, the, up to the five miles. The, the second thing is e-scooters are affordable, more, more affordable, more fun. And of course, the you know, easy to look at, easy to find uh, around that. And and as he said, that, as I said, that it's much more efficient. I mean, people are more conscious about environment. I mean, if you think of a car, you are a 40 tons of metal and one person sitting, traveling to five seven miles. So so the, this whole consciousness of people in about the environmental impact is is definitely helping us in in, in terms of bringing the e scooters. The, the, you know, into the minds of the people. Yeah. So yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Willem, any yeah. comments from your side on this polling? I think it's 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 great. I think it's interesting to see. Um, you know, the question being, which shared mobility modes do you think are most attractive in the region? Um, I like the idea that people are putting uh, metros and buses on. I think that's that's fantastic. Um, I'm sure. Also, there's a one here that you had the development of inner city. Uh, Dubai, Abu Dhabi on the high-speed rail, like looking at um, you know, that, that form of modality where we're doing the Hyperloop, for example. Uh, it's, it's great to know that, that out there in the audience, there's people that are aware and, and are interested in, in the development of these kinds of new forms of mobility, which is great. I foresee a future in the UAE where mobility itself is, um, is simply a service you subscribe to uh, much like you would subscribe now to your due telephone bill. Uh, you'd be paying for monthly for minutes of, of drive time, whether that be on a, on a scooter or with a car or with a metro or a bus. 
the idea of, of ownership of um, any kind of asset, especially highly depreciating assets like vehicles. You you buy a new car, you drive it off the lot, it's already depreciated by 25 percent. That 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 doesn't really make sense in, in today's today's world, in in my, in my view, and in my sort of children's generation, I think it's doubtful that they're even going to have a driver's license. Yeah, you know, I think by that point in time, in large cities, uh, most everyone will be in autonomous uh, vehicles. Yeah, I'm sure everyone here has read the latest article from from Elon. It just came out a couple of days ago, where they're they're insinuating the fact that they're very close to stage five. I don't know if that's necessarily true or not, but it's it's impressive to see that you know within the course of the next maybe five or ten years, realistically, most major uh, cities will have fully autonomous run uh, mobility solutions. Yeah. So really want to talk about autonomous five. Let's hold our thought on that. But let me ask yeah. Fatih. Fatih, what's your views on this? Especially maybe the crowd, the, the the audience here is very Middle Eastern here. Do you see differences in this voting trend in Europe? You know. Mm just in, in general, I think that the future of mobility is definitely multimodal, uh, you know, whether you talk about people or about freight. So that will be definitely uh, the future of it. Now, um, also, there is also something else. Uh, you have people who can afford to have a choice and, and other people who cannot afford to have a choice economically. And, and certainly with the crisis like the COVID-19 crisis, we may have see more people, you know, having uh, more challenges on, on the financial side. So therefore, uh, uh, car sharing, public transportation, whatever, uh, is the solution also. So, so, so therefore, I think that, you know, there is room for different modes, different ways uh, to consume mobility, because that will be the, the way also in the future. Now, um, in Europe, uh, uh, the very interesting thing related to that is that, you know, when the metros got open uh, and uh, they could not keep the distancing anymore after a few days because, they, you know, yeah. there are a lot of people who have no choice than, you know, to take, for example, the metro in cities like Paris or London or wherever. So this will have to be taken into consideration. However, there is something else that is... Uh, will be the outcome of the current crisis is that uh, uh, the proportion of people working from from home will increase and even from for the ones you know working at the office uh, they will have more time you know at home working from home because uh, uh, I was discussing with some senior executives and uh, what they've learned during this crisis is to trust more their workforce uh, that, you know, wherever they will be, uh, for most of the people, or uh, certainly for some roles, uh, they could be very op operational and even more operations in some instances. So that's, in a way, the world we will evolve to. Yeah. Father, you made a very interesting yeah. statement. You mentioned the economic impact on mobility. And I'll just like to bring out uh, this saying from the mayor of Bogota. Very interesting. He said, he said, the country is rich. Uh, where the rich people take a public transport to work. And I know that, for example, in London, even the members of parliament will take a public transport to go to work. Um, so it, you know, so there is, it's, it's an interesting um, correlation between development in a country and the impact it has on the usage of what mode of transport yeah. to get from A to B. Maybe one, one point, also something, an anecdote. You know, um, very often when people think about mobility, uh, they would think that, you know, people will go on the internet to look for a particular mode. But the yeah. interesting thing is that the most searched uh, item on internet is to go from point A to point B. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, and, and, uh, and that's very interesting. So that really says that, you know, people are more and more interested in the time it takes to go uh, door to door from one location to another, same for freight or whatever. So, and then at one point in time, you may use different means to, you know, to maximize that or improve that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about autonomous. Um, uh, Willem, you mentioned it very well. Um, you mentioned uh, the interesting, I read uh, Elon Musk's uh, uh, tweet myself, uh, not to mention that yesterday he got, uh, his tweets got hacked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask all of you, when do you see level five autonomy on our roads? 
So let's start with you, uh, Wilhelm. I would say um, everyone talks about 10 years, but I think realistically it's 20 years from now. For, for our roads out here, I would, I would say that, in my view. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of governance, there's a lot of elements that need to come into play uh, for, you know, level five exists now, right? So you can, you can watch like a, a, a sort of a Formula One race uh, driven by vehicles that are fully uh, level five, that are racing uh, around a track, that's fine. But you start adding in all of the elements associated with driving in day to day, you know, there's uh, people crossing the street and there's, you know, uh, weather and there's all kinds of different elements that are going to have massive impacts and factors. And that's why they have like an ethics committee that deals with these kinds of things in Germany. They're trying to figure out exactly like, what way should this vehicle go in case of this and this and this situation. And um, the reality is I think not only is the technology going to take a while, I think Google, Google is probably the front runner right now, but it's going to be, um, it's going to be a, a administrative and red tape nightmare, I think, for most uh, governments to kind of fully embrace autonomy. That's, that's my view on the matter. Yeah, thank you. Dirud, what would you say? Especially so, coming from a rocket scientist. So let me tell you, to give you the rocket scientist. That's a, that's a one. So I don't believe in the forecasting. And then the COVID has proven that forecasting. So forecasting works in a very interesting way. You take the historic data extrapolated, right? Who thought of COVID, right? If you add the COVID, your forecast will go down, diminishing yeah. terms, right? I believe in foresighting. So whenever you look at the, what's going to happen in the future, it's a foresighting. Let me tell you my view is, if the COVID does not, and if we don't come out of this COVID or totally out of it, back to the way we were in terms of the health and the, 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 the current confidence in the, in the people to move around freely within one year, I'll tell you the, the autonomous will be there in five years, level five. We understand the technology challenge is not there. The technology is there. The, the cars are enabled. They can run by themselves. The only challenge what we have is what I see is, is the coexistence of the manual versus the autonomous. The autonomous is not autonomous enough to overtake uh, the manual the manual human behaviors. That's the challenge. And, and of course, the infrastructure uh, on which we are running uh, the road infrastructure is not not ready for autonomous. But if this continues, from a foresighting point of view, what will happen? Autonomous is the only answer left to the to the government, to the policy makers, to the authorities. So I would say it's the five years now. Okay. All right. Interesting. Five and fifteen. Five and twenty. Let's listen from Fatih. <laughs> Especially Fatih, what do you think about autonomous in freight? Yeah, so between the four walls, I mean, we see that already. We, we, we see, uh, and we will see much more activities. Uh, I would say that also in closed areas, uh, and, and especially now uh, with the current crisis that has enhanced some, some trends towards uh, use of much more robots uh, for all kind of uh, safety reasons, for uh, cleaning reasons, or whatever. But uh, but also between the four walls, we had we had seen such a trend, and we will see that really increase, and maybe you can test much more things there. Now, outside uh, and also uh, outside the four walls, we, we may we will see that in some cities for the last mile, so the very last mile in some controlled areas. But what I say is that uh, also culturally, you have different tolerance to risks. So there are cultures that tolerate more risk than other ones. So that means that uh, uh, we may see uh, some of these vehicles sooner than we think in some parts of the world. Like it was the same debate for drones. So, uh, you know, and, and, and what we've seen now, and that was actually an outcome of the current uh, crisis, uh, it, it was the only means sometimes to reach some people uh, in some areas, including you know Western countries, so we we've seen much more uh, acceptance of, for example, drones. So I think that with the yeah. autonomous vehicles in level five, uh, there are parts of the world where it will take time for all kind of reasons, and of course ethics is part of it, and uh, also they have all the political debates or whatever legal debates. But in other parts of the world, uh, and maybe really big <laughs> parts of the world. Uh, we we may see that coming sooner than we think. Okay, excellent, interesting. Thanks, Fati. So, you know, let just in, in the benefit of listeners, let me try and explain a little bit about autonomous and summarize this particular debate here. So, autonomous, as Willem rightly said, is 
is talked about in five different levels. We today at level two or maybe entering 2.5 level, which is a car can do certain autonomous functions like the Tesla can do, for example. Some companies want to go to level three, but some want to jump to level four. In level four, say your journey from Dubai to Abu Dhabi could be completely autonomous, but you're still behind the wheel and you need to take over control and when the car asks you, but it'll give you enough warning to take over control. Level five is where the car has no steering wheel or a brake pedal. And literally you get in the car, you press your destination and you watch a Netflix movie. So interesting debate um, between five and 20 years. Um, I personally would maybe put it somewhere in the middle. I think we're looking at 10 to 15 years, but I do agree with the panelists that in certain situations in closed environments, we might see it much earlier. And I agree with you, Fatih, that especially in freight mobility, you know, there could be some opportunities, for example, in ports and others to run completely uh, autonomous functions, including drones. Now, very interesting, you mentioned about drones. One of the things when we talk about future of mobility, there's talking about, and this is very much going your way, Dheeraj, they're now talking about, you know, we, they're talking about new dimensions of mobility. So one dimension is using drones. They're talking about flying cars. They're talking about one dimension that we go more fast uh, on trains, high speed rail being used for freight as well as personal, but hyperloops underground. And also they're talking about going above 50,000 feet. So you can have a trip from Dubai to Sydney in four hours. Is this fiction or is this gonna happen? Well, I think that, the, so let me, let me just take you a, a little bit of what has happened in the past in terms of the economic paradigm shift, where the, the three core technologies, the communication, the transport, communi the, the communication energy and transportation. If we look at these three core company, core technology, we call it a, a general purpose technology platform, which has changed the whole economic paradigm in the past. So starting the, the late uh, 18th century, the steam press came and then you got the coal and then you got the locomotive, right? And that moved the economic activities. Then you move to the, the late, uh, the beginning of the 20th century, where you have the internet and as a communication, and then you had the, you know, the oil, and then you had the, the cars and the trucks on the road, right? Then we then we move to the, the beginning of 21st century after, you know, after the financial crash, crash the financial crash in 2008, right? When the oil prices reached 140. So what happened in that time is we got the internet, right? The, the 4G, 4G coming in as a communication. Then you have the energy networks, different modes of small energy pockets, which are connected to a network, which is digital network. And then you got the GPS enabled vehicles. So which is, we are talking about going forward is autonomous vehicle, right? So these economic paradigms have really created, a, you know, a general purpose technology platform. What's happening now is that everything is getting into the sensor space. So COVID-19, if you think of it, it's just the communication before COVID-19, we were all talking about WhatsApp chats and, you know, on the phone, and 4G, now all of a sudden, it has become a video conferencing, right? So video is like a on, video is, every time you want to call somebody, you don't, you just call video, right? It has become very common, effect of that. Energy has become a completely different now, the batteries and more efficient batteries. I remember the, the Tesla announced that, uh, the battery which could last for 1 million miles for a, for a car vehicle, for, for Tesla cars. And if you look at the, the mode of transport, has to improve because what has happened in the last 40, 50 years, the productivity, we are running at only 40%, the very, very, very poor productivity, very low efficiency. This has to improve because now even the COVID has taught us that they, you, how do you run with the limited resources, right? How do you run with a you know, more efficient way? So in order to, if you look at what happened, we had the Concorde supersonic jet, which was covering the distance in, from, you know, from London to New York in three hours. After that, it was killed and nothing happened, right? Now, where the efficiency? We are waste, we wasting time on the aircraft to, to, to fly one end to another end, right? So innovation has to happen and this faster mode of transport has to come in because now we have to be more efficient, we have to be more productive. And that's the trend and that's what is going to happen. And it's, it will it, come. I mean, there's, there's no, no choice left with that. Yeah, no, thank you, Dheeraj. Anybody else from the panel? Any comments on, on these new modes of transport and new dimensions of transport? 
I mean, I, the only thing I could add to that would be, you know, t I think tunneling uh, is going to become a, a big thing. Uh, just uh, listening to the keynote speaks uh, speeches that 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 Elon has, looking at building underground tunneling systems um, across California to make uh, speed of transport go much much faster. I think that's going to be a really interesting space moving forward. The idea being that you know, like flying sort of flying taxis and, and other kinds of drone mobility might be a lot of noise and visual pollution. So the trend might actually just be that underground transport, high speed transport underground is probably going to be the one that's favored in most cities. So you just don't have a, a bunch of things flying overhead all the time. Um, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it goes. Good, good. So Fadi, maybe on a similar line, let me ask you one interesting question. We talk about going into space, but at the same time, there's a very interesting mobility initiative by China, the China Belt Road Initiative, game changer. I mean, there are suggestions that freight transport coming from China, which takes 20 to 30 days, will be done in half the time. Uh, and one could take a holiday from Dubai to Beijing in the future. Um, what are your views um, about the China Belt Road Initiative and the impact it could have on future mobility? Yeah, so in general, um, we see you know, a trend towards uh, more trained usage in, in most parts of the world and, and for passengers, but certainly for freight. So uh, for the last five years, we've seen an increase of the rail usage between uh, China and Europe and, uh, on both ways. And, and we see that even further increasing now uh, because the costs uh, re uh, decreased, the infrastructures improved, uh, because at one point in time you had only one road, now you have uh, three to four of these roads, and that's important, especially winter time. You know, there you, you, know, you may have adverse uh, conditions, weather conditions that uh, impede you from using one or the road. Um, now, um, uh, what we see, we see already bottlenecks <laughs> there now at the moment because of all the usage. So it will be a question of uh, having um, better equipment, uh, better infrastructure, uh, and, and, and we'll just see an increase of that. Now, having said that, uh, uh, rail is uh, more expensive than ocean freight. So so that's in between an in-between solution also in terms of timelines so it may take you now even 13 days you know from china to you know western europe um so again it will be also part of the multimodal uh, solutions that will be used and it will be only uh, in the increase uh, in the future however uh, and it's needed because there is a limit to the number of aircraft you can have in the air until and, and of course they will need to pollute less and less and they will do so you have a limit also uh, on, on the number of uh, ships you have uh, also on the ocean because you know the limit is also the infrastructures you have in terms of harbors wherever so therefore you need different means you know to make sure that uh, you uh, serve your customers the right way also with the right timelines Okay, very interesting. Thank you. All right, I think we have a last poll question. Let's uh, let's push this to the uh, audience. Uh, so this question is another. It's a simple question. We want to ask you, which mobility modes do you see having the greatest growth in the next few years across our cities? Pick any two. I think we made a little typing mistake there. Car sharing and micro mobility should have been separate. Uh, but maybe if you don't mind either of them, just just click that one. Um, so which mobility modes do you see having the greatest growth in the next few years across our cities? So Willem, you mentioned this in the beginning that walking and cycling will grow more in our cities. Yeah. Cycling's already grown a lot. Uh, yeah. So yeah. we're seeing more and more of that happening. Walking is also increasing quite significantly. Uh, again, just to refer back to what I said previously, you can you can actually look at walking reports on Apple on the Apple Mobility. It's free to use. Um, also, some other interesting, cool, free resources um, is the Google Mobility Report. So they both have uh, Google the Google Report. You can type in a city there, and you can actually it'll give you a printout of 
um, what are the hotspot areas and what is the trending? Like, for example, supermarkets. How many people are going to supermarkets these days versus the baseline or cinema or, you know, or, or, or just being generally on the road or going to office buildings or these kinds of things? What kind of data is uh, coming out from, from all this stuff? But you can see, yeah, walking and cycling, um, big, big jumps in, in these kinds of forms of mobility, which in many ways is really kind of cool just from the sake of the fact that people are actually looking to do healthier for your body type forms of mobility. Of course, they're limited. You can't walk necessarily a mile to go or more or more walks, so let's say. So there are limitations for, for you know, last inch solutions or last yard solutions. But um, yeah, there are interesting trends that are happening now. Yeah, pretty decisive vote. So they don't people don't see the audience doesn't see private car and shift to bus services. That's interesting. Um, Dheeraj and Fatih, any comments on this? So um, this is interesting, and this supports my uh, argument for the autonomous will be in five years. So you know, the private cars are out, taxis are out. You're walking, cycling, and the, the you know the micro mobility is in, right? Which makes a perfect case for the autonomy. That means people are getting ready to get that. But very, um, very interestingly, uh, the cyclic and the micro mobility like scooter, right? Walking is definitely, definitely going to grow because of the hands and shoes. People are have learned that their immunity is most important, and then the walking is the best, thing, right? But if you think of the cycling and e-scooters, there's a very interesting thing that between the cycling and the e-scooters during the winter and harsh weather, right? If you cycle during the summers, you will sweat. But if you take the scooter, e-scooter you will get a breeze, right? So I can clearly see that the way the trend is going, maybe it's because of the current circumstances, but we are getting ready for you know, getting the private cars out of the way, making ourselves more efficient, more environmentally conscious, and that's how it's going to work. That's what it's clearly showing. Excellent, thank you, Dheeraj. Fatih, anything to add to this? Yeah. We will definitely see a trend towards micro mobility. We see that now. Here, yeah, I also represent, I would say, the logistics and freight industry. So, what we, we see also is a trend uh, towards uh, light transportation means uh, in cities, but also micro containerization. I don't know if you know, but one of the key revolutions uh, in the uh, transportation industry was the invention of a container. That was a, yeah. really a big revolution. And that's now what we will start to see, uh, you know, for uh, last mile deliveries and in town deliveries, all, all kind of, and, and then you may mix that with uh, autonomous <laughs> movements where you may have your micro container delivering to micro areas, you know, to, to people and then coming back to its base. So these are things that are being tested, being used already in some uh, closed uh, communities yeah. and uh, and we will see that and of course with that people can use even bikes with their micro container mm -hmm. and that's an example of the things we use in already in cities like amsterdam or wherever so that will definitely be um, a trend yeah Plus, so let's expand course, a little bit on this micro containerization yeah. when you say micro containerization is this the food delivery or that autonomous pod you see in streets in london going from a to b and delivering things is that what you mean by micro containerization yeah, so it means with this you you can already have your uh, packages already in a small container that is uh, linked to a bike or whatever or an electric bike very often uh, and 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 of course that helps you also dispatching more easily your goods towards the last mile. So you may have a, an electric van and from there, you know, you dispatch it into uh, different areas there, thanks to micro containers that uh, you would use with the, with the, with bikes, yeah, at one point in time. So that's, that's really something we will see. And, 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 you know, and if you look at it already in, in cities like Mumbai or wherever, some people, you know, use that traditionally <laughs> yes. in, uh, for, for a long time right so it's yeah. now just bringing you know a, a kind of digital spin and uh, and uh, innovation and technical uh, technological spin to things that happened already for some time and that worked very well in, in important urban centers with miracles in terms of uh, logistics yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, no, I totally agree, Fatih. Totally agree. Okay, we're coming to the last five minutes. So I'm going to ask each of the panelists just a very simple question. And I'm going to ask them to wrap up their uh, presentation with some bold future forecasts. So, Willem, what would be your bold future forecast on mobility? Okay, so, um, well, um, hmm. if we're talking about vehicles, um, I'll, maybe I'll take vehicles because that's sort of my uh, arena. Um, most all cars that are coming out now have a CAN bus or a computer in the vehicle that, that has in and of itself technology to API in with any, any system. Um, this could be related, for example, General Motors has on the OnStar program. Tesla has their very own computer platform within their vehicle. What, what I envision is gonna happen in, in the bridge until the next 15 years, like you're saying, until autonomy, is there's gonna be a hybrid phase whereby people can simply, with an app, uh, get any vehicle with an interconnected uh, system, like any car in the world. Um, it would be connected via your smartphone. You could simply, click on that vehicle, unlock, and, and drive that. It wouldn't require any third-party telematics units. It would simply be your phone speaking to the car. The, the newest and, and latest version of the, um, the Apple iPhone coming out is coming with a button where you can click to unlock a car. That's sort of the step one. Our view at eCar is that we're, we're actually looking towards working with OEMs internationally, and we have you know, in-depth conversations with a lot of the biggest players in the world about how are we gonna, or are you okay with unlocking, providing us with the API into your IoT, into your vehicles, such that in an instant, we can add hundreds of thousands of vehicles onto a platform like eCar, which can be used for people across the world to, to access mobility, to drive themselves, and simply just pay for the time that they wanna use, whether that be per minute basis or a subscription type basis where they can pay for that service per month. So I think that is the next sort of couple of years that's going to happen before autonomy. That's my that's my vision for the for the foreseeable near future. Excellent, thank you, Willem. Dheeraj? Well, uh, to me, uh, what what I see is is a integrated mobility, much more efficient integrated mobility, where from point A to point B, you have all there will be a space for uh, the every mode of transport. And this is much more efficient, say less than five miles, you get a micro mobility, the five miles to 10, 10, 15 miles, you get a car. From the more, longer than that, you get, you get a, a, a public transport, the train or the bus, and then you have some walk. It's already there, it's not there, it's not that it's not there, but it will be much, much, much more efficient with the use of the, the digital networks, which is, will be dedicatedly created for the transport uh, or, the, or the mobility world, and it has to be integrated with the city transport system. And it has to be integrated with one click, one payment, contactless, and all those things. But efficient integrated mobility transport system, which minimizes your travel time. That's what that's where it is, it is going. Excellent, thank you. Fatih, quick one for you. From yes, you. So we will move towards a world that uh, where people will want uh, environments that are safer and cleaner, hence an important trend towards sustainability by all means. So that's definitely something we see. We see it also politically. Uh, we see it with a, a lot of uh, consumers. So that will be very important. So a big trend towards uh, electrification. What we are going also to see uh, is a world where, you know, there will be a de-risking of the balance sheets. So we will see, I think, and we see already that, more outsourcing, uh, but also we will see people using more leasing, uh, more outsourcing also their fleet. We, we also will see also in transportation and freight, uh, we will see the usage of more usage of platforms, e-platforms. So in the same way that uh, you use Uber or whatever, uh, you are going to uh, 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 be able to book your freight in, in such a way, at least certainly for the last mile. And of course, for that, uh, you will need to make sure that you work with the right networks uh, and right partnerships. So we yeah. will see this rise of partnerships also there. Thank you. I think it's coming up to time. So Karan, I'll just quickly wrap up and pass it back to you. 
So just to, you know, uh, I've been taking notes while, uh, while we've been discussing and just to wrap it up in 30 seconds, the key things I found is um, we all believe that traffic is coming back to normal. Uh, Willem made a very good suggestion in Riyadh. It's almost as it was in January. So good to see that COVID uh, impact is now making life a bit more normal again. Um, I think we also talked about it and it's very clear from the voting that we saw e-commerce has been one of the big beneficiaries of uh, of covid and also we've seen a big shift in terms of from the voting patterns that we picked up into micro mobility solutions and e, e scooters in particular dinesh uh, dhiraj sorry looks like a promising business to be in um we've also talked about the economic impact of mobility very good point made there by you fatih and i totally agree with that i i guess we sort of uh, didn't agree on the autonomous timelines, but I guess anywhere between five to 15 years is what we sort of came up to. Let's see uh, when talk about this in another five, 10 years. Um, we also talked about, and we saw a big trend and the polls confirmed it, cycling, walking, car sharing, growing. And surprising for me was that private car and bus were seen as declining. And to the last question, I think very interesting. Uh, you talked about platformization of travel. You talked about integration of mobility, sustainability in mobility, and new mobility business models like leasing. So just to summarize, I believe the future of mobility is exciting, it's integrated, it's platform-based, and it will be multimodal. Thank you very much, and over to you, Karen. Thank you very much, Mr. Sarwant. Thank you, Mr. Wilhelm, Dr. Diraj, and Mr. Fatli, our amazing panelists, for joining us today and sharing your thoughts and perspective with us. I would like to thank once again our multilateral partner, Islamic Corporation, for the development of the private sector for sponsoring today's webinar. I would also like to thank our audience for participating and sharing their questions. So the link for today's webinar video will be presented for uh, via email or via chat and we're also conducting a short survey to get your feedback on today's webinar so the link to the survey as well it will be shared by chat and via email and to register for our next webinar schedule for 20th of july 2020 please visit our website www.aimcongress.com webinars and follow us in our social media channels once again i'm karen and I will see you all once again, and we look forward on the 20th of July. Thank you, and have a great, great day. More blessings. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.